Good evening, my dear fiends. Good evening. I am Bobby Gamunster, your creepy old curator of Gargoyle Manor at the Monster Museum, along with my co-host, Boris T. Buzzard. And we're here for another wonderful classic monster movie night. Aha! Uh -huh. It's not just any old time, my dear fiends. It's February. And in February, what happens, eh, Boris? It's Valentine's Day, the time of year where uh, loved ones gives their heart. And I'm no different. <laughs> As you can see, I have my own heart that I ripped out and put on a little pedestal for my beloved Melissa. Eh, Boris? <laughs> you helped me with that, didn't you? <laughs> he sure did. He had those little talons just digging away. And I'll present this to her later on tonight. <laughs> but first, in honor of this month and of the tradition, I thought I would bring out the film of Edgar Allan Poe called the Tale Tale Heart. <laughs> what more appropriate can you be for this time of year, eh, Boris? <laughs> of course not. Well, my dear fiends, let us get started and you get situated, get all re relaxed or unrelaxed, cut down the lights. <laughs> and let's go to tonight's feature starring. Lawrence Payne and Adrian Corey, the Tale Tale Heart. <laughs>
Yes, sir. I'm all right. Oh. Edgar. Oh, God. God, please. In the drawer, please. Please. Why won't you let me send for a doctor? No. I'm... I'm all right. All right. If there's anything you need... Yes. Yes, I'll... I'll send for you. My dear fiends, <laughs> you know, whenever we have an Edgar Allan Poe film, I'd like to bring out a few books from our uh, haunted library here at Gargoyle Manor. <laughs> and in fact, of course, my trusty old volume of Tales of Edgar Allan Poe. And let's see, let me get my reading glasses to go along with my regular glasses. It's just something when you have to have two pairs of glasses to to continue with. But anyway, uh, let's see. This particular tome was from Random House, New York, of course. And it was copyrighted in 1944 by Random House for this particular book. And, uh, oh, it's from the Random House of Canada Limited. <laughs> and let's see here. There's the Gold Bug, Murders in the Rue Morgue, Mystery of Marie Roger, uh, The Purloined Letter, and let's see here. Ah, The Telltale Heart, 505. Let's go right back here to 505. And because, you know, books are a staple for any uh, monster or horror host's um, library because you can learn so much about the subject of the films that you show. Uh, of course, you know, when you have a Frankenstein movie, you, um, you like to find out about Frankenstein. You like to go and, and look up uh, Marie Shelley. Uh, and here it is, uh, 502, and we're almost a Telltale Heart, and there it is. And let's see, we'll just, I'll just go with the first few lines. I won't read the whole thing, it's just too long. Uh, plus, you're, you're watching it as we go along tonight. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous. I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthy, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. <laughs> Sounds like love to me, especially in this time of month. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and of course, we don't just have uh, Edgar Allan Poe books back in the library. No, we have many other books. And this is one called Walking the Twilight Path. It's a gothic book of the dead. Now, you may have seen later uh, years 
uh, uh, ago when I had other uh, movies pertaining to the Book of the Dead. I had the Egyptian Book of the Dead and the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Well, this is a new one by Michelle Bellinger, somewhat new anyway. Um, and let's see, just a little bringing death into your life. Oh, you have dedicated yourself to this path, reaching out for your very first taste of transformative death energies. Having made a sacrifice related to your appearance, you have learned that change can be both painful and liberating. <laughs> oh, of course, you know, books are wonderful tools. Uh, of course, you talked about sacrifice, you know, in the book, Gothic Book of the Dead. Not always a sacrifice what you see in the movies where someone's holding a giant knife over someone's heart and cutting it out. No, no, no. Sacrifice usually means the giving up of something personal to you, like a, a, to, a token of love or, or uh, some piece of uh, money or something that's very important to you, but, you know, not, not a even though this is the book of the dead and about walking with through death and things like that they're not advocating murder not like uh, not like in tonight's feature with the telltale heart of edgar Allan poe <laughs> so my dear fiends if you ever get a chance to get out into the world or a library of gothicness uh, look up these books edgar Allan poe and the michelle bellinger eh so let's get back to tonight's feature Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning, Miss Marsh. I see you have someone new in the house. Miss Claire. Moved in yesterday. Feels like a nice lady. Miss Claire? That's right. Miss Betty Claire. You know her? Uh, no, no. She, she works near here, does she? Oh, mm, the florist down near the square. Yes. Thank you. Good morning. What was it you had in mind? A bunch of roses, perhaps. Or a... uh, yes, y yes, a bunch. This is. Oh. Can I help you, sir? A, a buttonhole, perhaps. How do you get to know a girl? How do you get to know a girl? Why, well, it's the easiest thing in the world. How? You've got somebody in mind. How? Tell me how. Well, it's hard to say. It depends on the girl, the place, so many things. Suppose... Suppose... She lived just across the street, but you'd never met her. Oh, that's easy. You wait for her to appear, you step forward, you raise your hat, and you say, how do you do? For no reason? Well, if she lives across the street, she's a neighbor. One talks to one's neighbors. Yes, yes, I suppose so. But, but what would you say? Well, either small talk, such as what a pleasant day it's been, that sort of thing, or the direct approach. Come right out in the open. Tell her you think she's attractive and you want her to dine with you. <laughs> you make it sound so easy. But it is easy, Edgar. Look here, what is all this? Are you thinking of finding yourself a girl? Suppose... Su suppose she rebuffs you. Slaps your face right out there in the street. Oh, yes, that's a risk. But it's one usually worth taking. Shop yesterday. Of course, I don't mind, Mr. Marsh. Thank you. Oh, may I? I'm not very heavy. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Uh, just a 
Just may I see you again? We're neighbors. N no, I meant perhaps we could meet for dinner sometime. Yes, I I'd like that. Tonight. How about tonight? Well, I, I work late. I, I can meet you here. I thought perhaps we could we could go to that little restaurant on the square. Very well. A day. Thank you. I was very lucky, too. I, I got work in the florist the day after I arrived. But uh, I've been doing all the talking. I like listening to you. Well, now it's your turn. Well, I, I, uh, I work as a librarian. I'm in charge of the reference section of the main library. Uh, is that all? I can't think of anything else to say. Well, well, what do you do with your spare time? Oh, well, I, I play chess mostly. Carl Loomis and I. Uh, Carl's a friend of mine. You'd like him. Everybody likes Carl. Oh, uh, who else lives in your house? No one. Live alone. In that big old house? Surely not. I prefer it that way. Would you like to dance? No, I, I, I'd sooner not. I, I don't mind if it's... It's, it's... it's getting a bit late. I think I ought to take you home. Yes, I... It's been a lovely evening. The stairway is very dark. May I see you at your door? Thank you. The uh, landlady doesn't believe in wasting light. She turns them all out at 10.30. Thank you, Edgar. I think I'll be safe now. Betty. Betty. Betty, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I... Can I help you, madame? I think you can go now, Betty. Oh, thank you, madame. You must forgive me for last night. Please let me see you again. If, if only just for one drink together. I'm... I'm sorry, Betty. Well... Perhaps one drink then. Are you doing anything tomorrow night? I, I was wondering whether we could do something rather special. Well, it, it's Saturday night. You wouldn't have to go to work the following day. Perhaps we could have, have dinner somewhere, or go somewhere and dance together. Or have you some other engagement? No, I'll come with you, Edgar.
been here quite often, but always on my own. It's all so crowded. Do you think we could have a drink? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, waiter, what should we have? Champagne. How about champagne? Well, I... Waiter, champagne, the best you have. We must come here again. Saturday, perhaps. How about next Saturday? Well, on Saturday, I think I'm... So many things I want to enjoy with you. I never realized how wonderful it is to share something. <laughs> it's Carl. You remember, I told you about him. Carl? Here's our table, David. Over here. <laughs> oh, pardon me a moment. I'll be right back. Don't be too long. Hey, Carl, I didn't expect to see you here. Carl, I want you to meet a great friend of mine, Betty Clare. Carl Loomis. I've told her so much about you. Good evening. I've looked forward to meeting you, Mr. Loomis. Carl, he's my best friend. That's right. I'm his best friend. Oh, this is wonderful. I've just ordered some champagne. You will stay and have a drink. I'm sorry, Edgar. I'm with people. Well, bring them over. Well, there's too many of them, and they're a little drunk. Oh, it's ridiculous. You can't just go like that. Now, just a few minutes, one drink. Yes, please do, Carl. Well, oh, that settles it. He's never been known to refuse a lady. <laughs> Very well. One drink. Wonderful. Thank you. But that was when I was halfway across the Americas. I've settled down since then. A first-class rolling stone to a second-rate scientist. I've got an awful lot to catch up on. But don't you miss the excitement? A little. But it wasn't all adventure, you know. Hard work most of the time. All the same, I wish I'd done it. Oh, and me, too. Well, you could, Edgar. There's nothing to keep you here now. It's easy to wander when you've got nowhere to come back to. Well, I must be getting back to my party. Oh, no, no, not yet, surely. I thought you might ask me to dance, Carl. Yes, do, Carl. Dance with Betty. Go on. Go on, Carl. Very well. Edgar is a decent sort. He's helped me out of a spot more than once. I like this place. There are better places. I haven't been in town long enough to know them. Not more than a week. Yes. So Edgar said. I've been working too hard to get around much. I work in the florist, on the square. Thank you. And another drink, Carl. Oh, no, no, thank you, Edgar. Really, I must get back to my party now. Good night, Miss Fair. Good night, Edgar. Good night, Carl. Um, same time tomorrow? Yes. Well, what did you think of him? I like him very much. I knew you would. Everybody likes Carl. Have some more champagne. What did you mean, uh, same time tomorrow? Oh, well, we always spend Sunday together. He comes to lunch and then we play chess. Yeah. Oh, Betty, you look beautiful. Really beautiful. What shall we drink to? You propose a toast. To a successful evening. Successful evening. <laughs> That's it, I'm afraid. Now your queen's gone. Two more moves and checkmate. <laughs> Another? No, thank you. Two beatings are quite enough for me. You, um... You haven't said a word about last night yet. Don't you think she's beautiful, Carl? She's very attractive. She's... she's... 
easy to talk to, to be with. You know what I'm like usually with women, petrified lest I should do the wrong thing, but it's not like that with Betty. I feel I can relax with her. Don't let your heart run away with you, Edgar. Well, what I mean is, it would be foolish to get in too deep with this girl. Why? Well, she's new in town. She's anxious to make friends. Well, that's lucky for me, isn't it? She's also your first real girlfriend. The first one always goes to a man's head. No, no, no. There'll be other girls. You'll see. Not for me. Just be sure, Edgar, that's all. Don't build your hopes too high. We have the same interests. Did I tell you? I lent her a copy of Ovid, and her reactions were exactly the same as mine. Now, that's rare in a woman, isn't it? I mean, a woman as... as gay and lovely as Betty. Excuse me, sir. There's a young lady to see you. A Miss Claire. Betty. Show her in. Betty. Edgar. Carl. I didn't mean to disturb you, but I, I wanted to return your book. I remembered how cautious you were about letting it out of your sight. Thank you. But, well, I suppose I'd better go. Oh, well, well now that you're here, won't, won't you stay and have a drink? No, I, I didn't mean to intrude on your game. Oh, nonsense. We've just finished, haven't we, Carl? Yes, yes, we've just finished. I, are you sure? I wouldn't dream of letting you go now. Please. Well, in that case... Oh, I, I was going to show you the line sketchings by Mirror. There are, there are over 50 of them, you see. Isn't that your plan? It's very pretty. Oh, he's only teasing you. He can play much better than that. How about it, Carl? What about that piece from Smatya? Please. got some reading to catch up on. And I must get up early. Thank you, Edgar. It's been a perfect evening. It was perfect for me, too. I'll see you, Edgar. When? Well, how about tomorrow evening? I'm free. Uh, well, Betty and I were already going out to dinner. Why don't you join us, Carl? Oh, no. Thank you. That, that's an excellent idea. Well, no, Well, I... you already said you were free. You know you don't like spending your evenings alone. Oh, I'll find something to do. Well, why bother when we're going anyway? Very well. Tomorrow, then. I, uh, I'll see you home. Oh, no, Edgar, it's much too late. Besides, I only live across the street. I'm sure Carl will see me to my door. Good night, Edgar. Good night. Goodbye, Edgar. Goodbye, Carl. This one, sir? Yes. That's easy to arrange. I'll have it mounted for you. How long will it take? Well, give me till tomorrow. Fine. Excuse me, sir. I would prefer something in advance, if you don't mind. Oh, yes, indeed. Shall we deliver it for you? Um, no, no. I, I'll, I'll pick it up in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Can I help you? best you have. Yes, sir. Something else to celebrate, Edgar? Perhaps, perhaps. 
outfit. My dear fiends, please subscribe and hit like on my YouTube channel. Spread the word and let's scare the uh, world with monsters on Monster Movie Night. <laughs> and as always, keep screaming. Betty, since that last time I haven't... Oh, Betty. Betty. No. It's late. I, I'm very tired. Yes, of course. I'm, I'm sorry. Good night, Edgar. Good night.
I'd better go. I mustn't be seen here by anybody. Is it Edgar you're worried about? Yes, I'm worried about Edgar. But you said you love me, Carl. I do, Betty. No other woman's ever had this effect on me. I do love you. And why worry about Edgar? Why did you go out with him? I don't know. It was a stranger here. I didn't know anyone. I suppose I felt sorry for him. Well, that's just it. He's to be pitied. So he invites pity. Don't you? He doesn't own me, Carl. Nobody wants to. To a man like Edgar, that's all that matters. You mean a great deal to him, Betty. And to you? What do you suggest? I'll break it to him gently. I'll tell him that we've fallen in love that we're going to get married. He's an intelligent man, he'll understand. He's got to understand. for you and wait to let you in. He's upstairs. Has he sent for a doctor? Wouldn't let me. All right, you can go now. Thank you, Mrs. Vine. You've waited late enough as it is. I'm staying, sir, if you think there's anything I can no, do. No, no, thank you. I can take care of things. You know, I've never been upstairs in this house before. Which is his room? It's on top of the stairs, sir. Thank you very much. Edgar? door is unlocked. Edgar, what's wrong? Come in, Carl. Come in. What's the matter? Are you sick? Sick? Yes, kind of sickness. Yes, well, I don't wonder. Sitting here with no fire. No light on. I'm soon of this place looking a bit more cheerful. No. No lights. Edgar, you've got to pull yourself out of this. Pour me a drink, will you? On the table by the window. You must get out of here. Sitting in one room all the time isn't doing you any good. I like this room. It's serene and tranquil. And the view is to be admired.
wouldn't go away. Not just like that. Not without telling me. If you will pardon me, Miss Clare, that may have been exactly the idea. What do you mean? We checked at Mr. Loomis' apartment. He is well known to his landlady, and indeed the whole district is a rather wild young man sowing plenty of wild oats. Paul wouldn't do this to me. Something's happened to him. An accident. We checked the hospitals, too. I shouldn't worry too much. It isn't the first time it's happened. Twice before, Mr. Loomis has been away on a discreet holiday to escape an unhappy gambling debt. Another time, a woman. And you won't do anything? There is nothing I can do. If, however, you bring me further information, something more definite. Mr. Marsh. Betty. Have you heard anything? No. I've just come from the police station. What did they say? The same as you. That Carl has gone away like this before. You're showing a great deal of concern for him. I... I, I don't like to think that anything's happened to him. It's been three days now, Edgar. Are you sure he said nothing to you? Carl didn't confide in me completely, you know. He can look after himself. I see you tonight. We can walk home together. There's a, a circus in town. I wonder whether perhaps later on... Not tonight, Edgar. I'm very tired. Perhaps another time. All right. Some other time. Good night. What are you doing? I'm trying to clean the lounge, sir. But the door's stuck. It's locked. You were right when you said that this house was far too big for just one person. So I decided to dispense with some of the rooms. That door will remain locked. But I ought at least to dust, I sir. said it would remain locked. As you say, sir. Are you all right, sir? The other evening when Mr. Loomis arrived... I should I... never have troubled him. I was all right. He only stayed for a few moments.
You know, my dear fiends, uh, at the beginning of every show, I always say that, you know, I'm your creepy old curator of Gargoyle Manor of the Monster Museum. Well, you know, it's not just monsters, it's Halloween and science fiction and fantasy and uh, magic and witchcraft and all the wonderful things that I hold dear and near to my loose, poor shriveled heart that I <laughs> had Boris help me uh, pull out and mount for my dear Melissa for Valentine's Day. <laughs> but, you know, Speaking of the museum, artifacts don't always have to be old. They can be well, they can be new as well. Um, such things as this uh, that I got this past uh, Yule. This is a, well, this is a Frankenstein uh, uh, item, which uh, Frankenstein's monster item, a little uh, figure. And uh, this is uh, Universal Monsters. This is the creature from the Black Lagoon. Now, let me get up here and I'll get just a little bit closer to you all, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> and let's see if I can show them to you from here or not. Well, a little bit dark over there and I almost fell down in my own museum. <laughs> I am so smooth. <laughs> I suppose I won't have to ever worry about anyone being saying how polished or smooth I am. <laughs> but you know what? I am real. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Anyway, this is the creature from the Black Lagoon and the Frankenstein monster. Okay, we got that this past Yule. And let's see. And a good friend of mine gave me the Invisible Man. And, uh, and you can see that he's got so many wonderful parts. And the actual figure here. And uh, there's, oh, there's the wrapped, unwrapped and wrapped and the book. And it's his uh, chemicals and uh, where he made the solution to become invisible and uh, it, it, it's a beautiful little outsiding of it. It's, it's, a, um, it's the poster from the Invisible Man and that all will also be in our museum. <laughs> spider, spider, run away. Oh my evilness. <laughs> We know we're not playing the House of Usher tonight. We're playing the Telltale Heart. So, my dear fiends, let's get back to it, shall we? <laughs> Why, yes, Monday evening. Mr. Marsh wasn't very well that night. In fact, he hasn't really been himself for some days now. He asked you to take a note to Mr. Loomis? Yes. Do you know what was in the note? I'm not in the habit of reading other people's letters. I think it was to ask him to come here straight away. Anyway, Mr. Loomis did arrive that evening. Mr. Loomis was here on Monday night? Yes. Now look, miss, I shouldn't be telling you all this, only you said you wanted to help Mr. Marsh. Yes, sir. I think he's a very sick man. I do want to help him. Please, Mrs. Vine, don't tell him I was here. Not yet. Very well, miss. My dear Miss Clare, your accusations are entirely without foundation. But Carl Loomis went to Edgar Marsh's house that evening. What if he did? Why hasn't Edgar said anything to me about it? Perhaps he wanted to spare your feelings. We spoke to Mr. Marsh, you know. He has known Loomis for years. He's got him out of many a scrape in the past. It's possible that Loomis went there to borrow money. Marsh hasn't mentioned it because 
Well, one doesn't mention that kind of thing. Oh, don't worry, Edgar Marsh. He could be insanely jealous. He, his mind could be twisted. Edgar Marsh has worked quietly as chief librarian in this town for many years. A thoroughly respectable citizen. No, 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 Miss Clare. You don't want to find Carl Loomis, do you? I don't want to persecute an innocent man. Some women never want to admit they've been thrown over. Not even to themselves. Do you think there might be something in what she says? Do you? Some cigars. Yes.
an ordinary poker. Then why hide it in his bedroom where there's no fire? Why hide it? Now, look here, miss. There may be a dozen explanations. I demand that you search that house. Oh, I can't do that. Not without the inspector's authority. Then find him. He's out on a case just now. I'll tell you what I will do, though. I'll make sure he sees this as soon as he gets back. Bishop. Bishop Miles. Check me. King moves. Check me. Try again. Try again. No good. I, I can't win. Check me. 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 <laughs> convincing that woman. Well, I told her you'd contact her as soon as you got back, sir. The morning will be soon enough. Here, put this away somewhere. Wait a minute. Here. Dried blood. Any sign? Street's empty, sir. I don't see why you're waiting. Why don't you just break in and search the house? That's not the way we do things, Miss Clare. Suspicion's one thing, evidence is another. You need evidence to break into a man's home. Mr. Marsh will come back, and then we'll ask him some questions. And if he doesn't come back, what then? We can talk about that later. Inspector.
Marsh. Well, you look as though you had rather a rough night. I... I've been... Betty, I... I know it's very early to call, Mr. Marsh, but I'd like to ask a few questions, if you don't mind. Shall we go inside? Inside? That's right, sir. We don't want to stand out here, do we? Well, sir, where shall we go? In here? Uh, no. In here. In the study. Now, you sit down, sir. I'll stand if you don't mind, but you sit down. Edgar, we want to know about Carl. Just a matter of routine, sir. You see, there is a possibility that our first ideas about the disappearance of Mr. Loomis may well have been inaccurate. You see, you neglected to tell us that he was there that Monday evening. Indeed, there is information to suggest that you asked him to come here, sent for him, in fact. Now, is that true, sir? I was sick. I, I asked him to come. For any particular reason, sir? I, I, wa I wanted him to bring some things, some, some personal things. How long was Mr. Loomis here that evening, sir? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite hear that. I said, how long was Mr. Loomis here that evening? I, 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 I don't know, I... Come, come now, Mr. Marsh, you must be able to hazard a guess. How long was Mr. Loomis here that evening? T t ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Did anyone see him leave here? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Now, just one or two more routine questions. <laughs> what did you and Mr. Loomis talk about that evening? Come now, you must remember what you spoke about. Mr. Marsh, I insist that you answer my question. Marsh. Mr. Marsh. Mr. Marsh! You know, don't you? You know! You can hear it, can't you? You can hear it! Hear yeah, what? The beating of his heart! The beating of his infernal heart! He's buried in there. But his, his heart keeps beating. I can't stop his heart from beating. I can't stop his heart from beating. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> Screaming loud enough to bring the house down. I... Yes, I'm all right now. I've had a nightmare. Tell me. Can I get you something? No, I... no, I'm, I'm fine now. Oh. Must have been quite a nightmare. Yes. Yes, it was. You were there, Carl. Oh. And I. I was in it, too, except that I, I had a limp. And, and there was a...
Well, my dear fiends, wasn't that a kicker? <laughs> uh, well, you know, guilt can, can always be that number one factor in not getting away with a perfect uh, murder, I guess you might could say. I mean, those hearts, they just want to keep on beating and beating and beating. <laughs> kind of like the Energizer Bunny a little bit, except for, well, you know, when the batteries run out of those, the heart, that is, ah, can't really just run out to the store and buy a new one, except for unless you're at the Frankenstein uh, Boutique. <laughs> well, my dear fiends, we hope that you have enjoyed another episode here at Monster Movie Night. <laughs> and until next time, as always, <laughs> keep screaming.